the Department of Gandhian and Peace Studies on behalf of Art History Visual Arts, uh, on behalf of Interdisciplinary Center for uh, Swami Vivekanand Studies, and on behalf of Dean Alumni Association, I, uh, to Manish Sharma, welcome you uh, to our Department of Gandhian and Peace Studies and to Punjab University. Uh, respected uh, sir, we uh, are celebrating uh, the, the the birth anniversary, 150th, 150, 152nd birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi ji. By remembering him and by remembering uh, the other freedom fighters, those who had given their life, who sacrificed their lives so that we can live in this present era. And uh, you had already seen that our department is one of the leading department in terms of uh, education, in terms of uh, research, and in terms of other activities. And in continuation of all these things, uh, instead of celebrating the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi only on 2nd October, generally we started with the kind of initiative that we should do some kind of activities by inviting distinguished speakers in, in this series. Uh, on 28th, we had invited Dr. Sanjay Joshi ji, who is uh, uh, the caretaker, uh, former caretaker of the Statue of Unity of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who is the Iron Man of India. So we had invited him uh, to our department via online mode, and he had given he had delivered the lecture on uh, the philosophy of Sardar Patel and the, his contribution towards the freedom struggle. Uh, yesterday, we had organized one. Uh, online competition, art painting competition of uh, uh, school children and of the faculty members and of the students, in which we had uh, taken four different aspects. One is uh, uh, my India is great, and the second one was uh, the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi of truth and nonviolence. The third one was how we can protect our environment, and then the fourth one was uh, cleanliness drive. So on these aspects, we had invited the competition posters and uh, on 2nd October, uh, we would be giving them the cash prizes in our special uh, online lecture. So in this series that today is your lecture and uh, uh, our respected honorable vice chancellor, sir, though he was supposed to attend this uh, webinar also, but because of his uh, pre-engagements and because some urgent meetings, he could not make it and he had given us his blessings and he'd ask that uh, in case if the time permits, so he will join in between. Our Professor Rajkumar is the vice chancellor who had given us a uh, different kind of inputs also that we keep on doing the good uh, research and he had tried his level best to bring this university into the top 10 universities of India. And we had already into the in, the, in this segment and some of our departments we, which are doing very well in terms of uh, ranking in terms of other infrastructure. And as you know that our university is one of the leading university in terms of research and other activities. So. Uh, Talking about Dr. Christian Bartov, uh, he had been a different kind of person who not only involved himself in terms of uh, collection of Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy, his uh, rich literature, but he had worked uh, sincerely in terms of uh, uh, different authors, in terms of uh, the ideology which influenced Gandhi to take the concept of truth and non-violence among them is the Tolstoy, then John Ruskin, and the other thinkers. And he had been at the Anti-War Museum Berlin, and uh, presently he is the Gandhi uh, is the president of Gandhi Information Center at Berlin. So he had written some books also, uh, like on Manifesto Against Conspiration and the Military System, The Birth of My Life, The Correspondence of Mahatma Gandhi, and but the late Holland and War and Peace. These are some of uh, his uh, uh, main writings. And apart from that, uh, he had been uh, instrumental in bringing out the different kind of exhibitions like on Bread and Roses, Violence Against War, Eldrick Huxley, Alphabets of Peace. Then he had uh, bring the exhibition on Steady War, No More. Then on Henry David Thoreau, Give Me Truth, who had influenced Gandhi a lot. And uh, in terms of his education, he had done his uh, Doctor of Philosophy, uh, Doctor of, uh, in for uh, on Education Sciences and Psychology. Then he had done diploma, two diplomas in Education Sciences and Political Science. And uh, apart from that, he had been uh, different kind of at, at, at different platforms also. And one of his uh, uh, volumes of uh, Volume One and Two, which were uh, basically on the uh, pacifism in the USA. Uh, they are uh, and the other uh, works which he had written. They are, were well, they were taken by different uh, personalities, and they uh, he was uh, given the aspiration that 
that when we are bringing these kind of things in front of the students also, so they will be able to inspire. Uh, he will. Uh, they will be able to take the new causes of uh, this. Why we are moving towards war and why we can't uh, uh, come back to the old uh, kind of uh, situation where we can live with the. Uh, we can live with the uh, with the with the nature and with other kind of thing which were uh, given more emphasis by Gandhi and by other uh, speakers. So I will not be coming in between you and uh, our uh, learner speaker. So before I uh, give you the podium, sir, uh, I would like to share some of my thoughts with you that when uh, we were talking about uh, how we can go for the lecture also, and you had just rightly said that. I would be discussing about Huxley because whenever we are talking about Huxley, we generally talk about his uh, one of the main uh, novel that is Brave New World, which changed the society, which which bring the different kind of uh, uh, changes in in his own life also. That it, because his Brave New World was uh, basically based on uh, principles of mass production, and in case if we uh, compare it with the Hind Swaraj of Gandhi's of 1909, so they. Uh, correlates with each other, and moreover, uh, the kind of uh, the the person uh, Aldous Huxley was that. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was reading about him, uh, I came uh, to know that he was nominated for Nobel Prize in Literature nine times, and he was elected as the champion uh, companion of literature by Royal Society of Literature in 1962. So uh, I would request our uh, other. Uh, personalities also and other uh, research scholars as well as faculty members also that in case at the end of this lecture if we can raise certain questions relating to the presentation and if we have some kind of uh, uh, thoughts uh, with us that how we can take up this uh, research to the new heights and how we can bring Huxley back to our life and because so far uh, as I can remember in our department though we had used Huxley as uh, the person in the brave new world and who defined that humanity is not uh, safe for this particular century and is the biggest killer of his own kith and kin. So apart from these things, what we can further learn from Eldrick Huxley and and as you are the author on this particular uh, chapter and uh, and if you can throw some more light on this and uh, on his. Uh, uh, other novel, which uh, which is also known as ends and means, and in terms of we compare it with Gandhi, and in terms of his own ends and means, and how this uh, uh, brave new world changed his life as well as he changes his perception, he changes his uh, country. Also, he moved from London to USA, but before to Mexico also. So, how we can uh, bring those things into it? So, over to you, sir, and welcome once again to this uh, department. Thank you, sir. And to your unit, sir, uh, sir, with your permission, uh, can I request all my participants to switch on their camera for uh, yes. just a minute so that we can click Take photograph the and posterity? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, whosoever, sir. We, we, whosoever is possible for that. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ashu, ma'am. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mohit. Thank you, thank you. So we can see Dr. Mohit. And yes, Dr. sir, sir. Yes, yeah. many of my colleagues sure. are there, sir. Right. Uh, some of my students also, Dr. sir. Atul, Atul is also there. Good. Akriti, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Nidhi ji is also there. Lot of our colleagues are there. Uh, welcome, Karamjit. Welcome. Okay, sir, sir, you can continue, please, please. Thank you, thank you. I'm so glad to be in your company. And uh, meet. And I'm also happy, <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to continue this exchange of experience and ideas with reference to Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, called the Mahatma, and who inspired the world. And one of them was me. And since the beginning of my uh, youth, I would say, when I learned to know the greatness of Gandhi as a humble person who was also preparing some sandals in prison for his political enemy, John Christian Smuts. And I thought what a wonderful way of non-retaliation that was to present a pair of 
sandals or shoes to a political opponent. And not from his home, but from prison cell in South Africa. And he learned the skills, sandal made, making via his German Jewish friend, the architect from Johannesburg, Hermann Kallenbach, who himself learned this art of sandal making from, from the Trappist monastery of German Trappist monks in Marion Hill in South Africa. So you see there is some uh, hidden relation between Germany and India and the uh, history of Satyagraha is uh, very closely linked with Gandhi's Jewish friends and associates, Hermann Kallenbach, Sonja Schlesin, and uh, Henry Solomon Leon Pollack and others, who as the Europeans supported Gandhi's right course for the emancipation of the Indian community. That was the time of British colonialism. And during the past decades, I was thinking about Gandhi from the point of view of history writing, because I thought it is good to understand Gandhi in um, with the full knowledge of the historical background. And as we all are not experts in a narrow sense, but we learn from day to day, this uh, invitation gives me the chance to speak about the relation between ends and means and the relation of Mahatma Gandhi to the Huxley family. Because actually it's not just Aldous Huxley, but also his grandfather and his brother who are in relation with Mahatma Gandhi in a, um, even in a correspondence. And this starts from the South African days back. And you can see races in uh, in Swaraj, hard to believe, but in Hin Swaraj or Indian Home Rule 1909, you have this a reference to the Huxley family first time. But in the very same first political program of Gandhi, uh, written as a dialogue with an advocate of revolutionary violence, he pleaded for nonviolent resistance as the means to achieve Indian independence, Swaraj. And he refers to ends and means. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> you can say means and ends. And he always gives this um, metaphor, this visual image of a seed and a tree. And Gandhi wrote, the seed is never seen. It works underneath the ground, is itself destroyed. And the tree which rises above the ground is alone seen. The means may be likened to a seed, the end to a tree. And there is just the same inviolable connection between the means and the end as there is between the seed and the tree. And in the end of my lecture, I will also give you the continuation, which will show you immediately the historical background of this thought between ends and means. And in chapter 18 on education, Gandhi extensively quotes Aldous Huxley's grandfather, 
Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a biologist, 1825 to 1895. But he wrote a book about liberal education. Thomas Henry Huxley's A Liberal Education and Where to Find It from 1868 was an address to the South London Working Men's College. So I looked for this context of this quote and Gandhi expresses his views on education in Hinswaraj or Indian Home Rule. And this quote of Thomas Henry Huxley is as follows. That man, I think, has had a liberal education who has been so trained in youth that his body is the ready servant of his will and does with ease and pleasure all the work that, as a mechanism, it is capable of, whose intellect is a clear, cold, logic engine with all its parts of equal strength and in smooth working order, ready like a steam engine to be turned to any kind of work and spin the gossamers as well as forge the anchors of the mind, whose mind is stored with the knowledge of the great and fundamental truths of nature and of the laws of her operations, one who, no stunted ascetic, is full of life and fire but whose passions are trained to come to heal by a vigorous will, the servant of a tender conscience, who has learned to love all beauty, whether of nature or of art, to hate all vileness and to respect others as himself. Such a one and no other, I conceive, has had a liberal education, for he is, as completely as a man can be, in harmony with nature. He will make the best of her and she of him. They will get on together rarely, she as his ever beneficent mother, he as her mouthpiece, her conscious self, her minister and interpreter. Where is such an education as this to be had? Where is there any approximation to it? Has anyone tried to found such an education? Looking over the length and breadth of these islands, I'm afraid that all these question, all these questions must receive a negative answer. Consider our primary schools and what is taught in them. So this was the quote of Thomas Henry Huxley from a liberal education and where to find it. And this is the guideline for Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi in his book, Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule, 1909. But there's also, you know, another reference to education. When Gandhi in his later life, shortly before his death, he wrote a letter to Julian Huxley. Oh, it's Julian Huxley, Julian, Sir Julian Sorel Huxley, 1887 to 1975, was an evolutionary biologist, eugenicist and internationalist. Also, he was the brother of Aldous Huxley. And he was UNESCO's first director general. And Gandhi had already published in his weekly newspaper, Harijan, a statement on UNESCO. Gandhi wrote in, that was 16 of November, 1947, I am deeply interested in the efforts of the United Nations Economic, Social and Cultural Organization to secure peace 
through educational and cultural activities. I fully appreciate that real security and lasting peace cannot be secured so long as extreme inequalities in education and culture exist as they do among the nations of the world. Light must be carried even to the remotest homes in the less fortunate countries which are in comparative darkness. And I think that in this course, the nations which are economically and educationally advanced have a special responsibility. So this had been written by Gandhi in 1947. And um, you find another statement of 1947, this letter addressed to the Director General of UNESCO, Dr. Julian Sorrell Huxley, the brother of Aldous Huxley, written from a Bangi colony in New Delhi on 25th of May, 1947. And it is published in Human Rights, Comments and Interpretations, a symposium edited by UNESCO with an introduction by Jacques Maritain, Paris, 25th of July, 1948. And here, uh, in this um, letter, which was printed in the Hindustan Times on 19th of October, 1947, you find the following passage written by Gandhi. I learned from my illiterate but wise mother that all rights to be deserved and preserved came from duty well done. The very right to live accrues to us only when we do the duty of the citizenship of the world. From this one fundamental statement, perhaps it is easy enough to define the duties of man and woman and correlate every right to some corresponding duty to be first performed. Every other right can be shown to be usurpation hardly worth fighting for. So far, the letter to Julian Huxley. But now let's come to Aldous Huxley. And here we find a kind of remarkable testament text of Huxley when he was asked actually what he believed in after the Second World War, after the catastrophe of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that was in 1952, he was asked and wrote a text, Learning to Get Out of the Way, a text which was then published by Edward Murrow, a very committed journalist. And in this text, Aldous Huxley explicitly referred to Mahatma Gandhi. To devise a perfect social order is probably beyond our powers. But I believe that it is perfectly possible for us to reduce the number of dangerous temptations to a level far below that which is tolerated at the present time. A society so arranged that there shall be a minimum of dangerous temptations. This is the end towards which, as a citizen, I have to strive. In my efforts to that end, I can make use of a great variety of means. Do good ends justify the use of intrinsically bad means? On the level of theory, the point can be argued indefinitely. In practice, meanwhile, I find that the means 
employed invariably, determine the nature of the end achieved. Indeed, as Mahatma Gandhi was never tired of insisting, the means are the end in its preliminary stages. Men have put forth enormous efforts to make their world a better place to live in. But except in regard to gadgets, plumbing and hygiene, their success has been pathetically small. Hell, as the prophet has said, hell, as the prophet has it, is paved with good intentions. And so long as we go on trying to realize our ideals by bad or merely inappropriate means, our good intentions will come to the same bad ends. In this consists the tragedy and the irony of history. Can I, as an individual, do anything to make future history a little less tragic and less ironic than history past and present? I believe I can. As a citizen, I can use all my intelligence and all my goodwill to develop political means that shall be of the same kind and quality as the ideal ends which I am trying to achieve. And as a person, as a psychophysical organism, I can learn how to get out of the way so that the divine source of my life and consciousness can come out of eclipse and shine through me. I show you the cover of this publication. And this is um, a text of Paul Huxley. And uh, if you like, at the end of this lecture, we can also listen to him in an audio voice recording. And when I show you some of the panels of our exhibition on Old Saxley, which we were happy to publish, and you see that I give this references in the chat where you can find them on the internet. So the same with the two audio recordings now, which you find and also then the reference to our exhibition, which was called by us Alphabet of Peace, Commitment Against War. But why was it called so? Because uh, Aldous Huxley wrote two remarkable books during the 30s actually, where he referred explicitly to Mahatma Gandhi, advocated his principles of nonviolent non-cooperation and boycott also um, civil disobedience. And one of them was called Hands and Means, and one was called an encyclopedia of pacifism. And this encyclopedia, edited by Aldous Huxley, uh, was published in 1937 in London. You know, uh, excuse me, sir, if you have uh, uh, the uh, 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 if you have the copy in your uh, system, if you can show it uh, to us via sharing it by screen. So it would be more easy to recognize those things. Ah, if, see. If, if you want to share your screen, also, you can share it via, via your screen also. Yes, maybe I can show you. Um, so this was not my intention now, but we can do it right now if you like. Yes, we can. I can share the screen and show you some panels of our exhibition. Uh, and some of these panels explicitly refer to Mahatma Gandhi. These are all panels with quotes of Huxley referring to India or to 
Aldous Huxley. So if you give me the chance now to share the screen, then I will show you this um, this exhibition. Yes. I also uh, suggest to our research scholars as well as to the faculty members and others that in case if you have certain questions relating to the presentation, they can pen down them and they at the end we can have it uh, by the chat box also. And uh, if you want to raise the question directly, you can uh, raise directly also. Over to you, sir. Yeah, that will be very nice. Yes. Here you see the the internet version of our exhibition, which I created together with my good very good friend and collaborator, Dr. Dominic Meeting of the Free University Berlin, the lecturer in political science. And you see he also explicitly, we refer in our poster, in our first page uh, to these two works in, from 1937, Hands and Means and an Encyclopedia of Pacifism. And you also find two direct ref uh, links to the audio voice recordings because Aldous Huxley uh, was somehow impressed by a BBC journalist who asked him to give a contribution for a series of lectures on the causes of war. And he insisted on describing the psychological, not the economic, causes of war in 1934. So you also find the original voice of this text and also, as you see here, the cover and the contents of this 1935 publication and the text, which was actually uh, a product of BBC. This is one example, and also here you find the original voice of the text I quoted just right now, and also the text itself. So this is one. Now I show you some exhibition posters of this 2019-2019 exhibition, which we showed in the Peace Gallery of the Berlin Anti-War Museum, I volunteered to create uh, 21 exhibitions for the Anti-War Museum. And here you see the cover. That's right. So this is the cover of his book, An Encyclopedia of Pacifism. Maybe I give you the quote, the proper quote, um, from this book which you find actually uh, on uh, which you find on page 82. It is in the East that we find the most striking examples of nonviolence practiced by large groups. In South Africa, late in India, Gandhi organized nonviolent resistance to the government. The South African experiment was remarkably successful. In, in India, a number of very considerable successes were recorded, and it was shown that very large groups of men and women could be trained to respond to the most brutal treatment with a quiet courage and equanimity that profoundly impressed their opponents. The spectators in the immediate vicinity and through press accounts, the public opinion of the whole civilized world. You see, uh, this encyclopedia of pacifism was published under the auspices of the Peace Pledge Union in London, 
and the peace pledge union dated back to the day when the English Anglican priest and Dean of Canterbury, Hugh Richard Laurie Shepherd, or Dick Shepherd, on 16th of October 1934, invited any man who felt as he did to send him a postcard stating that he renounced war and would never again take part in another one. <clears throat> and by the beginning of 1937, can you imagine almost 130,000 citizens of the British Empire declared, we renounce war and never again, directly or indirectly, will we support or sanction another. And Aldous Saxley gave lectures in many English cities to gain support for this peace pledge of the Peace Pledge Union. And the Peace Pledge Union is still existing and actually the the most active peace education organization in the United Kingdom, in, in England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. I'll show you the white poppy symbol here. Maybe you, 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 you see it here. Yeah, you see the white poppy alternative to the red poppy commemorating the war veterans. This is the white poppy for peace. And this white poppy is the creation of the Peace Pledge Union today. It, it was created to, to make young people think before they volunteer to join the army. And this, um, this deep impression on the effects of war dated back to the First World War when Aldous Huxley witnessed the trial against conscientious objectors, many of them Tolstoyans, followers of Tolstoy. Uh, and Huxley witnessed the the trials against these objectors. As we know, many thousands objectors, some were, uh, say, total objectors, some were prepared to do some, um, some service. But uh, let me just stress the fact that Aldous Saxe was not just giving lectures during the 30s, but that he was really concerned about educating adults, you see, educating, so adult education, so training for conscious citizens, how to, to realize the basic rights, the basic human rights, to foster peace, not prepare war. So this was Aldous Huxley's concern. And one I want to go on and show you another uh, another alphabet letter you see as reference to Buddha. And it is quite interesting that Huxley refers to Buddha in this quote by mentioning that the teaching of Buddha forbids even laymen to have anything to do with the manufacture and sale of arms while the making with or with the making of poisons and intoxicants with soldiering or the slaughter of animals. You find these quotes, by the way, in the collected essay of the collected essays of Aldous Huxley. And this is um, um I don't know, maybe seven or eight volumes, you can see these uh, volumes are very precious for understanding. And then you have also references to the causes of war that was started by a correspondence of Albert Einstein, the physicist and the psychoanalyst uh, Sigmund Freud about the causes of war. And you have here uh, references to the golden rule, what to do others, what you do not want 
others do to you, which you find in many religions, particularly with reference to the Chinese teachings of the Tao and the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, the ancient wisdom of Lao Tzu. This is, by the way, a painting which was which is shown in the United Nations by Norman Rockwell. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the golden rule in a positive version. This was Aldous Huxley as a child. This is a reference to the age born. This is Aldous Huxley as an older man portrait. And here you have a direct reference to Hint Swaraj. So Aldous Huxley wrote nearly 40 years ago in his Hint Swaraj, Gandhi asked his compatriots what they meant by such phrases as self-government and home rule. Did they merely want a social organization of the kind then prevailing, but in the hands not of English, but of Indian politicians and administrators? If so, their wish was merely to get rid of the tiger while carefully preserving for themselves its tigerish nature. Or were they prepared to mean by Swaraj what Gandhi himself meant by it? The realization of the highest potentialities of Indian civilization by persons who had learned to govern themselves individually and to undertake collective action in the spirit and by the methods of Satyagra. Here you find a photo of Maria and Aldous Huxley, the couple in Berlin, 1932, where they visited the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Dahlem with research on genes. So that was inspiring also, brave new worlds and statements against the dangers of eugenics and gene manipulation. This is a statement against the national nationalist symbols, which you find here, with a particular reference to the British and US American symbols. Here you find the direct reference to Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, also the lesson we can learn, not just the Chinese people and uh, the Chinese um, party leaders, no, every one of us. And you see here Lao Tzu sitting very quietly on this animal, carrying him, not forcing, not putting pressure on this animal, sharing his wisdom while crossing the border. And the German poet Bertolt Brecht wrote a wonderful poem about this, about the legend, the legend of the origin of the Tao Te Ching. Um, on the way of Lao Tzu to immigration. And here you see a photo of the funeral of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi's body was borne to the pyre on a weapons carrier. There were tanks and armored cars in the funeral procession and detachments of soldiers and police. Circling overhead were fighter planes of the Indian Air Force. All these instruments of violent coercion were paraded in honor of the apostle of nonviolence and soul force. It is an inevitable irony, for by definition, a nation is a sovereign community possessing the means to make war against other sovereign communities. 
Consequently, a national tribute to any individual, even if that individual be a Gandhi, must always and necessarily take the form of a play of military and coercive might. It's very sad, you know. It's very, um, but very serene, this remark. Some reference to nationalism with the Remembrance Day postcard of London, you see here for Armistice Day. This might be interesting. You, you see here a, a stamp, 50 years, 75 years old, Satyagra, but you find also this quote of Huxley. The only methods by which a people can protect itself against the tyranny of rulers possessing a modern police force are the nonviolent methods of massive non-cooperation and civil disobedience. Such methods are the only ones which give the people a chance of taking advantage of its numerical superiority to the ruling caste and to discount its manifest inferiority in armaments. For this reason, it is enormously important that the principles of nonviolence should be propagated rapidly and over the widest possible area. For it is only by means of well and widely organized movements of nonviolence that the populations of the world can hope to avoid that enslavement to the state, which in so many countries is already an accomplished fact, and which the threat of war and the advance of technology are in process of accomplishing elsewhere. Nonviolence presents the only hope of salvation. But in order to resist the assaults of a numerous and efficient police, or in the case of foreign invasion of soldiers, nonviolent movements will have to be well organized and widely spread. This is quite significant. This insistence not just address the religious people, the people with a religious belief, but also atheists and to organize very well nonviolent resistance. This was also uh, in tune with Mahatma Gandhi's efforts. And actually both Gandhi as well as uh, Huxley referred to the basic poem of nonviolent resistance by Percy with Shelley, written actually with reference to the massacre in Peterloo Fields at Manchester. And this poem, The Mask of Anarchy, was also quoted by Gandhi sometimes. It describes the method of nonviolence. Let me maybe give you two of this. Stand ye calm and resolute, like a forest close and mute, with folded arms and looks that are weapons of unvanquished war. And if then the tyrants dare, let them ride among you there, slash and stab and maim and you, what they like that let them do. With folded arms and steady eyes, and little fear and less surprise, look upon them as they slay till their rage has passed away. Then they will return with shame to the place from which they came. And the blood thus shed will speak in hot blushes on their cheek. Every woman in the land will point at them as they stand. They will hardly dare to greet their acquaintance in the street. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration. That slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Shelley's Mask of Anarchy. You find it in Encyclopedia of Pacifism. This is Shelley, posthumous poetry of Shelley who died in a young age in Italy. And then 
actually was quite clear about the modern warfare and the effects on civilian population. This is a document of the Peace Pledge Union that Huxley supported. And this is a typical, you know, um, headline of a very constructive program for pacifists in the 30s in the United Kingdom. What are you going to do about it? The case for constructive peace. And don't think that all this Huxley was alone. Of course not. There were Dick Shepard, Vera Britton, and other great pacifists. But don't think that all the great intellectuals of um, the United Kingdom joined this movement. Not at all. Here you find a publication of a talk of Dick Shepard with Aldous Huxley. And this is a poster for a public meeting. Warning against war. You see, that was almost at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. And it was quite clear that escalation will not be easy to prevent. And the Second World War was on the brink. So this is a direct reference to Satyagraha. This is a reference to Thoreau and Gandhi. In South Africa, late in India, Gandhi and his followers were confronted by an oppressive government armed with overwhelming military might. Gandhi, who is not only an idealist and a man of principle, but also an intensely practical politician, attempted to cope with this seemingly desperate situation by organizing a nonviolent form of direct action, which he called Satyagraha. It is often argued that Satyagraha cannot work against an organization whose leaders are prepared to exploit their military superiority without calm or scruple. And of course, this may very well be the case. No more than any other form of political action, violent or otherwise, can Satyagraha guarantee success. But even though against an entirely ruthless and fanatical opponent, non-cooperation and what Thoreau called civil disobedience, coupled with a disciplined willingness to accept and even to court sacrificial suffering, may prove unavailing, the resulting situation could not be materially any worse that it would have been if the intolerable oppression had been passively accepted or else resisted unavailingly by force. While psychologically and morally, it would in all probability be very much better, better for those participating in the Satyagra and better in the eyes of spectators and of those who merely heard of the achievement at second hand. And that was the first theory of nonviolent resistance written by a collaborator of Mahatma Gandhi, Richard B. Gregg. And you find here the London edition of this book, Training for Peace, a program for peace workers with an introduction by Aldous Huxley and published by the Peace Pledge Union. Now this would be a very important lecture I give tomorrow, by the way, on Gandhi against fascism, um, and also Huxley against totalitarianism, because he was against fascism as well, against fascism as well as against Bolshevism. And as Gandhi, he criticized the system of legal and also economic universal military conscription fascists, also with the democratic nations. And what, another great theoretic of these 30s of the last century, all before the Second World War, all even during at the beginning of the war in Spain, where it was Bartholomew de Licht, and Gandhi had a 
correspondence with Bart de Licht, and I published this correspondence first time in English language under the title um, Breath of My Life. And you find also a lecture uh, for the Association of Indian Scholars at the YouTube channel, if you like to know more about this. And actually, also on the page of the uh, Gandhi Foundation in Amsterdam, you find the texts, many texts. And here you find this uh, theor theoretic, you know, book, The Conquest of Violence by Bartelicht, with an introduction by Aldous Huxley. It is a concise plan of nonviolent resistance against the military invasion, including resistance of trade unions. And don't forget that Gandhi had signed the manifesto against conscription, the anti-conscription manifesto of the War Sisters International, which was started by Hans Korn in 1925 and organized by Runham Brown and then signed by Albert Einstein and many others, followed by the manifesto against the military education of the youth signed by Sigmund Freud and many authors, Tagore signed this. And all these documents were in, during the twenties already. So this is the background. And also in his Encyclopedia of Pacifism, Aldous Huxley referred to this first very comprehensive statement of principles of the war this is international much more comprehensive than nowadays and this is the second book i uh, show you here the original of this book my hand which was published by Aldous Huxley after the second world war it was it is called science liberty and peace. And um, in, in this year, 1946, after the catastrophe of the atom bombs on the Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Huxley published this essay, Science, Liberty and Peace, in which he explicitly referred to the Indian scholar Krishnalal Sridharani's pioneer work, War Without Violence, a study of Gandhi's method and its accomplishments, published in New York in 1939. And Huxley elaborated and summarized his final perspective on Mahatma Gandhi, which could start raising awareness of this yet little known spiritual friendship between the two great thinkers of the last century. Aldous Huxley wrote, is there any way out of the unfavorable political situation in which, thanks to applied science, the masses now find themselves? So far, only one hopeful issue has been discovered. In South Africa and later in India, Gandhi and his followers were confronted by an oppressive government armed with overwhelming military might. Gandhi, who is not only an idealist and a man of principle, but also an intensely practical politician, attempted to cope with this seemingly desperate situation by organizing a nonviolent form of direct action, which he called Satyagraha. And the quote we gave here in the exhibition was explicitly referring to xenophobia. There is also another way in which the preparation for war is useful to the holders of centralized political power. And here he refers to a flood of xenophobic or imperialistic propaganda also as a mean, means of war preparation. Yeah, of course, combined with an appeal for strong policy and national unity, etc. Also about the context between a highly centralized government and militarism. And um, so actually we can learn a lot from this uh, thoughts of all the Saxony, which he published in his essays, not in his novels only, you see. 
I will go to the novels in a few seconds. And here, this is a reference uh, on the production of war toys yeah, as, a, as a means of education for war in the in the militarized countries. And uh, Gandhi also warned against the uh, militarizing of democracies. This is a letter to George Orwell, who had different political views, you know, but both of them appreciated their dystopian visions, their dystopian novels. And maybe I'll tell you a bit what I mean when I say dystopian novels, so just to have a fresh look on the literature of Aldous Huxley. In the year 1927, after Huxley with his wife went to South and East Asia, he first described his dystopian vision of a future society with consumerism, eugenics, and strict hierarchies. A dystopia, or simply anti-utopia, is a community or society that is undesirable or frightening. It is translated as not good place. An antonym of utopia, and utopia, as we know, was a term that was coined by Sir Thomas More and figures in the title of his most well-known work, Utopia. And utopia is the blueprint for an ideal society with no crime or poverty. Dystopian societies appear in many artistic works, particularly in stories set in the future. Some of the most famous examples, I give you three. One is the novel 1984 by George Orwell. And George Orwell's, the real name was Eric Blair. And Eric Blair was Huxley's pupil in French lessons at Eton College. And the second is Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. The third, I would like to mention, which is not mm, so highlighted as it deserves to be, is Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. That is the temperature when paper begins to burn. And this vision is that all books will disappear by the burning of books, you see. And of course, we can see now we associate this with the digitalization which replaces the real libraries, which is a great danger, you know, to preserve the cultural heritage, of course. So you see that these dystopias are often characterized by dehumanization, totalitarian governments, environmental disaster, or other characteristics associated with the cataclysmic decline of society. Dystopian societies appear in many subgenres of fiction and are often used to draw attention to real world issues regarding society, environment, politics, economics, religion, psychology, ethics, science, technology, which if unaddressed could potentially lead to such a dystopia like condition as, <clears throat> as uh, Huxley uh, described in Vanity Fair 1927. And he describes actually as a substitute for Brave New World, I, I give you this quote just to summarize the main warnings of Huxley against this future, this dark future that in the future, Huxley wrote that we envisage in the future, eugenics will be practiced to, in order to improve the human breed and the instincts will not be ruthlessly repressed, but as far as possible, sublimated so as to express themselves in socially harmless ways. Education will not be the same for all individuals. Children of different types will receive different training. Society will be organized as a hierarchy of mental quality and the form of government will be aristocratic in the literal sense of the world. 
in the literal sense of the word. That is to say, the best will rule. The future of the immediate future will be a more definite and detailed version of the future of the present. Our children may look forward to the establishment of a new caste system based on differences in natural ability to a Machiavellian system of education designed to give the members of the lower castes that which it is profitable which it is profitable for the members of the upper castes that they should know. In time, eugenic breeding may to a great extent falsify these prophecies by abolishing the lower castes altogether, in which case it is possible that political democracy may be revived in a new form. But these are contingencies too remote to be discussed. You see, it was in 1927, before writing Brave New World. The reference to the term caste can only be explained by Aldous Huxley's personal encounter with Mahatma Gandhi and the leaders of the Congress movement, Sarojini Naidu, Motilal Nehru, in India before. You know, that was a time when Huxley still had a kind of aristocratic identity. He was uh, um, disrespecting, actually, politics. He was actually a writer, successful writer. But when he was in India, he started to transform. And as mm -hmm. I told you in the beginning of the 30s, you know, when the rise of Mussolini's and Hitler's fascism was obvious. And the question was how to prevent a second world war. He became very committed and followed the principles of Gandhi before he criticized Gandhi. It is quite interesting to read his article in Vanity Fair, which you find on the internet also, where he refers to the Maxim gun, you know, this uh, effective, brutal, machine gun which was invented by the British and which caused so many casualties in wars. You know, actually, there are two remarkable instances, and maybe this uh, could be the beginning of the end of my lecture, um, which might be remarkable for us. So I will just refer to these two incidents. One was the fact that Aldous Huxley attended the Congress at Cornpool and his thought about Gandhi, his the impression Gandhi made on him in this personal encounter when he attended the Cornpool Congress session. This is one thing. Then I would like to mention his encounter with the great Indian scientist, Sir J.C. Bosa. And then at last, I would like to give, give you at least one thought of Huxley, uh, which he wrote about Gandhi in the volume published by Dr. Savipali Radhakrishnan, later president of India, a note on Gandhi, which Huxley wrote, and his very remarkable thought comparing Gandhi with the first, one of the first presidents of the United States and the difference between them. Now, the first is that I would like to mention again that Huxley went to India and he had a very strong impression of Sarojini Naidu. It has been our good fortune while in Bombay to meet Mrs. Sarojini Naidu 
the newly elected president of the All India Congress and a woman who combines in the most remarkable way great intellectual power with charm, sweetness with courageous energy, a white culture with originality, an earnestness with humor. If all Indian politicians are like Mrs. Naidu, then the country is fortunate indeed. So when Huxley attended the All India Congress at Cornpo and listened to Gandhi's address, immediately he realized, quote, the soul of every Indian is overflowing with love and respect for Mahatma Gandhi. And actually, what comes into his mind, you know, Huxley is a very educated man, a quote from a famous quote from Edward Gibbons, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Sir Edward Gibbon. And this quote describes actually in Huxley's eyes, the saintly authority of Gandhi. His stature was small, his appearance contemptible, but his eye was keen and lively, and he possessed that vehemence of speech, which seldom fails to impart the persuasion of the soul. Such is William of Tyre's description of Peter the Hermit. It would serve equally well as a description of Mahatma Gandhi. This the saint of popular imagination is a person of majestic carriage with a large intellectual forehead, expressive and luminous eyes. Uh, and a good deal of waved hair, preferably of a snowy whiteness. I do not profess to be very well up in hagiology, but my impression is that the majority of the saints about whom we know any personal details have not conformed to this ideal time. They have been more like Peter the Hermit and Mahatma Gandhi. The qualities which make a man a saint, faith, an indomitable will, a passion for self-sacrifice, are not those that extrinsicate themselves in striking bodily stigmata. Men of great intellectual capacities generally look what they are. Sometimes it happens that these persons are further possessed of saintly qualities, and then we have the picturesque saint of popular imagination. But one can be a saint without possessing those qualities of mind which mold the face of genius into such striking and unforgettable forms. Looking through the crowd in the Congress tent, the casual observer would have been struck by the appearance of Mrs. Sarojini Naidu, the president of the Congress, of Pandit Mutilal Nehru, the leader of the Swarajist party. These people, he would have said, are somehow intrinsically important. Their faces proclaim it. It is probable that he would never even have noticed the little man in the dhoti with a shawl over his naked shoulders, the emaciated little man with a shaved head, the large ears, the rather foxy features, the quiet little man whose appearance is only remarkable when he laughs. For he laughs with the wholehearted laughter of a child, and his smile has an unexpected and boyish charm. No, the casual observer would probably never even have noticed Mahatma Gandhi. And then he describes Gandhi with Benjamin Disraeli of uh, the British Empire. In India, things are different, he said. 
In India, the most influential popular leader of modern times is Gandhi, who is a saint and an ascetic, not a politician at all. That was his idea then. Sanctity and political astuteness are rarely combined. Gandhi's saintliness gave him power over the people. But then he said, Huxley said, then, but he lacked the political ability to use that power to the best advantage. This judgment he revised later, as we know. Now, uh, it is a coincidence that Gandhi encountered, invited, was invited by Sir J.C. Boson. And let us remember, Aldous Huxley was one of the uh, reasonable and sensitive contemporaries of Gandhi and Sir J.C. Bose, who Mahatma Gandhi referred to in his eternal spiritual message. Thanks to the marvelous researches of Sir J.C. Bose, it can now be proved that even matter is life. This message was later recorded for the Columbia Gramophone Company on October 20, 1931, and written already in 1928 under the title God Is. And uh, actually, it is quite interesting that he refers to vegetarianism in this context. So Huxley, as many Europeans, felt challenged when in India. He's, he decided to read the autobiography of Gandhi on his way to Southeast Asia then. He was tremendously influenced by Gandhi and his meeting with Gandhi, but also by Sir J.C. Bose. And this is what, how uh, Aldous Huxley summarized the value of traveling. But if travel brings a conviction of human diversity, it, it brings an equally strong conviction of human unity. It inculcates tolerance, but it also shows what are the limits of possible toleration. Religions and moral codes, forms of government and of society are almost endlessly varied, and each has a right to its separate existence. But a oneness underlies this diversity. All men, whatever their beliefs, their habits, their way of life, have a sense of values. And the values are everywhere and in all kinds of society broadly the same. Goodness, beauty, wisdom and knowledge. With the human possessors of these qualities, the human creators of things and thoughts and doubt with them have always, everywhere, always and everywhere been honored. Goodness, beauty, wisdom, and knowledge. And this is written in Huxley's diary on his travel to India and Burma. It was Jesting Pilot. This is the title of this diary, Testing Pilot, published in 1926. So, now let me come to a conclusion. When Huxley was asked to give a tribute to Gandhi in the essays and reflection on Gandhi's life and work presented to Gandhi on his 70th birthday, October 2nd, 1939. You can read Aldous Huxley's contribution in the second edition, London, 1949, and also in Prabhuda Bharat, volume 53, issue 8, 1948. Aldous Huxley wrote in his note on Gandhi, a comparison with Thomas Jefferson. And here it is a comparison of the principle of militia, you know, self-defense with guns, 
and the nonviolent resistance principle of Mahatma Gandhi's political philosophy. So Huxley wrote in his note on Gandhi, Gandhi, like Jefferson, thought of politics in moral and religious terms. That is why his proposed solutions bear so close a resemblance to those proposed by the great American. That he went further than Jefferson, for example, in recommending economic as well as political decentralization, decentralization, and in advocating the use of satyagraha in place of the wards, quote, elementary exercises of militia, unquote, is due to the fact that his, Gandhi's ethic was more radical and his religion more profoundly realistic than Jefferson's. Jefferson's plan was not adopted, nor was Gandhi so much the worse for us and our descendants. So, this was my introduction to this um, unknown spiritual friendship of Mohandas Karamchand, Gandhi called the Mahatma, and the British writer, Aldous Huxley, who even, as we know, influenced the world of music when he wrote his Doors of Perception, which was then a reason for the famous Jim Morrison and the Doors to name their music group and create the title Break on Through to the Other Side. And this Doors, by the way, Doors of Perception image refers back to William Blake, another great visionary and thinker of the British cosmology of ideas, which we are slowly rediscovering with great appreciation, of course. So thank you for listening such a long time. And uh, there's much more to add and say, you see here, uh, it is a, a very, very interesting um, journey to rediscover and also ends and means, you see here, refers to Gandhi explicitly. You find this in the internetarchive.org, which is a wonderful resource uh, created by UNESCO, I think. I'm not quite sure, but it's a very interesting a chance to have facsimile of uh, it's a free access, facsimile of this book, Ends and Means. Go back to the beginning. Uh, this is um, this other book, which I cannot show you in the original, but you find it here. And this is the title page. An inquiry into the nature of ideals and into the methods employed for their realization. And here you find the table of contents, decentralization and self-government, nature of the modern state, social reform, individual work for reform, inequality, education. And you see this 15th chapter, ethics. So actually my, um, my contribution is a contribution to ethics. Um, when I decided to speak to you about ends and means. Do you remember how I started this lecture? I started this lecture by referring to Inswaraj, remember? 
and then I gave this uh, reference of Gandhi to the seed and the tree. Now I would like to invite you just to prove that Gandhi's contribution is the most essential contribution to the history of anti-slavery movement. I want to explain to you, uh, if you continue this quote, which I read to you, then Gandhi refers to a historical date, and we shall try to find out the meaning of this date in the course of our dialogue. I want to first give you this um, continuation of the quote about ends and means. And um, then, uh, in the course of our dialogue, I can explain to you the meaning of the date. Yes. So I go back to that quote of Finswaraj. And remember the inviolable connection between the means and the end, as there is between the seed and the tree. And Gandhi goes, continues. I am not likely to obtain the result flowing from the worship of God by laying myself prostrate before Satan. If therefore anyone were to say, I want to worship God, it does not matter that I do so by means of Satan, it would be set down as ignorant folly. We reap exactly as we sow. And then, and then Gandhi continues with the English in 1833. And this date in the British history, but in the, in the history of mankind, is the date of the Slavery Abolition Act, brought about by nonviolent resistance in the beginning. So just to tell you how closely linked this ends and means is not just by the re rejection of all war and the plea for nonviolence as a principle, but also how inseparably linked this is with the history of the anti-slavery movement. The movement against slavery, following the footsteps of Henry David Thoreau and the recommendation of Leo Tolstoy in his letter to an Indian to, to Tarak Nath Das, which Gandhi printed in his uh, Indian opinion in South Africa, with the uh, permission and the great joy of Count Leo Tolstoy from Russia. So we have the thorough Tolstoy, Gandhi, Martin Luther King tradition of re rejection of all slavery and all war. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for providing such uh, uh, rich information about Gandhi and Albert Huxley. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was going through about uh, how we can uh, start with the kind of different information about uh, Albert Huxley, because uh, some of the books, uh, some of the material is still available with us, like as you mentioned that uh, John Bandura, the, uh, the, uh, the, the conquest of the violence. The Conquest of Violence is the title of yes. John Bondura, John Bondura. That's right? Yes. That's, it's a wonderful yes. book. I learned yes. so much. That, yes. And that, also that, the so... title of Bart, Bart de Licht's book. So it's a, it's a same title for two great books. Two, two great, yeah. yes. And uh, Richard B. Craig and the other books which you just mentioned. So uh, we do have a collection of about 7,000 books in our library. Wonderful. Uh, department library, including the 100 volumes of Mahatma Gandhi also. So uh, while coming back to the point that in 1930 in July, so uh, Eldrick Huxley had written one article on Gandhi that what Gandhi uh, fails to see. Uh, if yeah. 
can uh, uh, can bring something more about it because in that he come across Gandhi in a different way and later on uh, his perception was totally changed. So if you can narrate it with that one, and I request the uh, other faculty members and other students also that in case if they can come up uh, with the different kind of questions with relating to the presentation or if they want to ask something more about Aldrich Huxley and those who are familiar with the movies. So uh, Pride and Prejudice uh, is the is is his 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 work and the Walt Disney uh, uh, they had also accepted him as as one of his one of the biggest writer. So there are so many other works of Eldrick Huxley, which we can see in a different uh, English movies or in the fiction movies also. So over to you, sir, in case if you can. Uh, this is the article which I'm talking about. I know what Gandhi failed to see. Yes. In yes. Vanity Fair, right? Yes. yes. And yeah, whatever, uh, whatever and happens, we have got the uh, maximum gun and they have not. So this is the title. Uh, this is the first uh, quote. Yes. Line. And by the way, you find this uh, article on the internet. Have you have you seen that article on the internet? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes sir. Uh, I can have you the share the link? Perhaps do you have the link address for the participants? Uh, that might be uh, interesting. I just uh, try to find out at the moment. Uh, uh, I have it in the soft copy. So I will just uh, let's see if I can share it. Just give me one second. Yeah, one moment. This is interesting. I hope uh, I find it for you. Yeah, I think I, I noted it down somewhere. I, I find yeah. it for you in a, in a few seconds. I I think I made I will a... also just bring it back. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got it now. I can share the link now. And then it is quite interesting at least to uh, maybe to listen to Huxley referring to this Maxim gun, which is uh, yes. quite interesting. Um, I just share it in the chat, this, um, this link here. So this is the link to the Vanity Fair article. And if we yeah. open this yeah. article. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, I got it from, from there, yeah. Yeah. And even in this article where he, you know, he, makes quite precise the criticism against Gandhi mm. in 1930, by the way, and he himself identified as a British citizen then. He was not a cosmopolitan uh, in that moment of time. He was deeply skeptical, of course, and uh, not just an astute crit critical mind, but also he was still uh, continuing this aristocratic um, despise of all political solutions, I think. And he, we shall not forget, was also a great a writer of satire, so a satirist, yeah. Um, here, he, the, the slogan of this um, article, maybe I, uh, I just quoted, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. So this uh, harsh criticism of British imperialism is, in, even in this article, you, you can find it. By the way, uh, Gandhi's um, statements against British imperialism during the 30s and the 40s are quite revealing in this context. So uh, owing, and this is a best way of uh, self-criticism and also set a, satirizing uh, satire, owing to the ingenuity of Sir Hiram Maxim, Englishmen are safe at home and have empires abroad. Wonderful, huh? it's only one sentence, just to, just to give you this uh, sentence as the starting point to rediscover this article. Um, we are training them in a word to produce Maxim guns of their own. What will happen when they have thoroughly mastered our lesson, when they possess as many guns as we do, when they can fight, that is to say, on technologically equal terms and with a vast superiority of numbers? I'm not a prophet. So if you 
then reflect upon the fact that Gandhi had a disagreement with Congress leaders about um, national self-defense and the building up of an army. And also, if you go back and uh, have a look at the atrocities caused by the Maxim gun in history, and uh, if, just by um, referring first to the Wikipedia article and then go beyond, then you see that there is a, a, a treasure to be hidden, uh, a hidden treasure to be rediscovered also in, in the essays of and articles of, of, of Huxley. And he continues, meanwhile, the Maxim gun is still more or less exclusively in our possession, but, and so on and so on. Uh, Actually, the, uh, this article is worth being studied. And I would uh, recommend you to see also the difference between this first article and the later statements, which I quoted extensively. So we should never forget that during the mm -hmm. beginning of the 30s, there was also a rivalry, a rivalry of, uh, you say, the socialist and communist um, a youth political program proposals and uh, and Gandhi's strategy. So in a way we have um, with all sympathy from my side uh, for socialist independent socialist approaches, we have uh, also those who favored militia uh, as a military, um, strategy uh, in, the, in the traditional line of Jean Jaurès from France, like even Karl von Ossietzky, who were not, uh, we would say, radical pacifists or non-violent pacifists. But we also see uh, the, the lack of experience, what can be brought about on a national scale by non-violent resistance, because the sword march was a challenge, not only to Indian contemporaries from other different political factions, but also a great challenge for Europeans. And um, mm. particularly British citizens of the British Empire uh, in, in, the, uh, in the United Kingdom, as we say now. So I would... Uh, yeah. I would uh, just um, encourage you to rediscover the collected essays of yes. Yes. Uh, Aldous Huxley and a wonderful collection which has been published uh, some years ago, which I used as the basis for my research first. And in fact, uh, yes, that's a good uh, suggestion, sir. And in fact, uh, I would uh, uh, try to bring those essays uh, for our uh, uh, for our library also, and in case if we cannot take it, then we will try to have the Xerox copy of that one uh, from you or from somewhere else. And in fact, as we just started earlier, that uh, we started with the concept of Hinsavraj, then uh, with the concept of Brave New World. And in the light of that, I think Mansi had just raised one question that uh, if you could please throw yeah. some light on the matter of Afghanistan in light of the Gandhian principles. Uh, can that be managed through non-violence? Is the world committing an ignorant folly there? So over to you, sir. So good that I'm not prepared to read now what Gandhi said about um, the Afghan fighters and how um, how well received they were, would be by him and his Indian fellow countrymen. So. Uh, Good that I need not prove my expertise by uh, giving you the quote, but you, you find quotes with, with, ref, ref, uh, with reference to Afghan fighters. But uh, in this context, it might be interesting to listen to all the lectures given about the Kudait Kitmat Gas, which were a, a, you know, an example of organized nonviolent resistors by those who were used to, to exert force usually and to organize themselves in such a way that they were visible because of their red shirts, but also because 
because they are com combine social reform with nonviolent resistance in the most effective way. And Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan and Bacha Khan was a Pashtun. The frontier Gandhi. Yeah, frontier Gandhi, that's right. And I read his autobiography, My Life and Struggle in New Delhi. I remember that when I was there first time in 1985. Hmm. So I think it is important. And uh, if I'm uh, informed correctly, Mani Bawan will organize a lecture on Bacha Khan by Tusha Gandhi tomorrow. So you yes, yes, there's a lecture, down. yeah. Uh, I will be also there. Yeah, and you can also find hmm. information about these, many, many of these events during Gandhi Jayanti, which is now good luck since 2007, the International Day of Nonviolence by the United Nations. And we all know that this was a great um, step ahead because of the Indian foreign minister then, Mr. Sharma. He was uh, really doing well by um, gaining the unanimity of the United Nations General Assembly to adopt this re resolution after half a year. And I was invited to the pioneer conference of India and South Africa by uh, surprise in January 2007 to New Delhi. And I, I remember very well that I felt um, like participating in a very uh, interesting event, um, bringing about to establish a new norm an ethical norm in the United Nations, which is a permanent institution. This International Day of Nonviolence is the official recognition of nonviolence, nonviolent ethics as the basic norm for the United Nations system. And this is exactly what was necessary, uh, considering the discrepancy uh, between the United Nations Charter and the uh, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights which is actually the real Magna Carta for mankind. Now, I would like to um, say that it is not just yeah. important to refer back to the Kudai Kitma girls and their uh, role, which had in the 30s, when Gandhi wanted to um, prove the effectivity of organized nonviolent resistance, but also, I would like to say that it Would shall be now a concern of the United Nations to find a way to bring about reform for the society in Afghanistan because the human rights violations are so grave that we are all concerned. This is what I want to say. So it's a United Nations uh, agenda number one issue now. It's not just the, the matter of uh, Afghanistan and the neighboring countries like Pakistan. So we shall really, or Iran, we shall really uh, be concerned um, even more now after this, um, after this events of this year, after such a long time of guerrilla warfare and asymmetric warfare, etc. Uh, which was uh, foreseeable, at, at least by, yeah. by uh, friends of mine and myself, who warned against um, illusions, and not just because of the particular Afghanistan uh, situation, but also because, and uh, beca not only because of the history, which is even linked with Rudyard Kipling, as we know, and. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the failure of the British in, in the northwestern frontier provinces and, and, and beyond. There were a real, you know, there are real um, basic uh, problems, even referring to, as we know, drug policies and, uh, uh, and um, economic profit system we are living in with, which are so um, closely linked with um, precious resources to be gained, etc. All this is uh, on on the agenda a debate, should be a debate. And now uh, I hope that there will be a real people's reform of the United Nations in future so that we can organize uh, conflicts, internal and also international conflicts 
um, in the framework of a world federation without national armies and also with a very clear constitution and a dispute of international settlements. And without, you know, the, the perspective, the, uh, the, the lack of perspective, which we have in frozen conflicts now in many places of the world. Uh, yes, sir. We are taking now the last question. Uh, one of the students, they, they had just asked, sir, how Huxley principles uh, principle like peace can play a role in current global situation where we see power struggle is posing threat to the world peace, for example, situation in Indo-Pacific. Hmm. Yeah. So this would be another lecture I offer to you for free, as you see. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Definitely. Uh, we would love to hear lecture from about, you again. Definitely. Yeah. It would be a, a, another <laughs> title of a topic. Yeah, the title would be Gandhi and the That's nuclear right, war. Yeah, and Gandhi, because we we have uh, to huh? to face the fact that we are still living in this nuclear age, although we are living in a different oh, century, okay. and um, the, the problems of the last century we have not like uh, not started to solve uh, efficiently. Uh, there are so many fine activities. Uh, to come to an end with weapons of mass destruction, but you know that this has not happened so far. So there is so much to be done, but we cannot solve this in international disputes on territory, territory claims or border disputes only, or hegemon hegemonial um, claims, but also uh, we should see that there is a reform of the international system necessary to to bring about a, something like a constitution. You understand, without a world center, without a world center, but a constitution where all can agree upon, also an understanding of human rights. And this is has not happened. This is what I complain that um, there are not sufficient activities to bring about a consensus building in the in the international system of 194 or five uh, nations nowadays, yeah? and some of them not acknowledged as nations in the territories as we know. So we have to bring about a reform of the international system, we would say, of international politics. And it's as urgent, and I think that uh, the representatives of the United Nations would not be angry with me if they listen to me now. So this is uh, not I, my I, I I just want a minute. Is it possible? Just a minute. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. uh, sir, thank you very much. Wonderful. Your presentation was very informative, very intelligent, and very useful. So I just uh, want to thank you. I had no such idea about Huxley, though I had read somewhere, but not in details. So I am benefited. So nice of you. Thank you very much. It was very researched presentation. Nice of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, during uh, the recent uh, uh, remarks by our Honorable Prime Minister in the United Nations. In his address, he had mentioned that uh, UN has to change its policy so that uh, we can come out with a different kind of uh, uh, balance act and it should be equal for every nation. So I think uh, these uh, reforms are the need of the hour. And now, uh, though we had uh, scheduled this uh, uh, webinar for 90 minutes, now it's already more than 120 minutes. So thank you to you, sir, that uh, still people are engaged with us and they yes. are still uh, in, in terms with us. So uh, hardly anybody left the whole of the yes. webinar. Everybody yes. is so thank mesmerized you. by this. Yes. And in fact, as I just mentioned that uh, being uh, uh, we are teaching about the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi, but uh, uh, we had just used Huxley as in the brave new world, but not in such in practical sense. So now we would be thinking about these things and uh, being our uh, respected uh, Professor Sanjeev K. Sharma ji is with us uh, and he's being one of the co-organizers. Hmm? Professor Sanjeev ji. Yes, and uh, yes. 
And let me, Professor, I, I'm not from uh, <laughs> social sciences, I'm from <laughs> commerce. But but I'm really uh, thankful yeah, to you, sir. It was a uh, very, it was let literally me, a seminal a session. Introduction about you, sir. Uh, let and, me. Let me. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, it was indeed very sure. illuminating and uh, literally a window on how the Western world looks and uh, uh, draws inspiration from the Mahatma. Uh, so uh, you are indeed a repository of knowledge uh, and encyclopedia on Mahatma. Uh, so I must uh, thank uh, Madam Shukla Ji for roping you in. For, for for this session uh, uh, so so it is indeed my proud privilege to uh, thank all the uh, participants uh, to the learner speaker okay. and the gathering for uh, joining this webinar this this sir this webinar is in part of the series of events we are planning to commemorate the mahatma uh, as uh, my colleague um, uh, manish uh, highlighted and all this is under our uh, under the leadership of our vice chancellor uh, who is who could not attend today's seminar, but he has sent his blessings and uh, uh, greetings to you, uh, sir. Uh, uh, in this in this whole process, I will just take a minute to explain the the Gandhian philosophy, Gandhian ideology is all pervasive in uh, contemporary time in India. So you look at uh, uh, Make it India, you look at Skill India, you look at Serve Sikhya Abhiyan, you look you at uh, universal health uh, programs. So so. Gandhi's footprints are uh, all across the, the, the policy uh, formulation in India. Uh, so thank you, sir, for highlighting uh, his contributions. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will request you again to join us on some other yeah, theme on another aspect of the Mahatma. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best so, for you. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Hope to see you again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, before we leave, as we had... And thank you enough for this wonderful talk. Uh, yes, thank you thank so you, much, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you to each and every one. So I would be sharing the screen and, room and room. I will be taking you to hmm? towards our university. And we will be sharing our thank video you. also. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just thank give you. me a minute. I'm, I'm sharing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sanjeev, get down. And thank you enough for this most wonderful talk. So, so glad. Thank you Amanda so and Takshina are part of our great history and touch. serve the students for all over the globe. Today, we have a university that carried the torch of being an absolute destination for knowledge and education since 1869. Started as Punjab University College at Hall, December 8, 1869, the institution today has a remarkable journey and story worth spreading. The university established its law school in 1870 and started to confer degrees in the year 1882. In the year 1938, Bahadur Mia Muhammad Afzal Hussain was appointed the first vice chancellor of the university. On November 26, 1947, Justice Teja Singh became the first vice chancellor of East Punjab University. It was January 26, 1950. That East Punjab University was renamed as Punjab University. The city beautiful, Chandigarh, a city that was done by one of the greatest architects of the time, Lurkabuzi, kind of a pilgrimage for the ones who appreciate the works of Lurkabuzi and Pierre Chenery. It was the year 1956 when Punjab University shifted its office from Solan to Chandigarh. The year 1957 July, Visionary Vice Chancellor took the charge of Punjab University, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who laid the foundation of science laboratories in February 1957 and opened Punjab University Library on October 1963 and went on to say, A university stands for humanism, for tolerance, for reason, for the adventure of ideas and the search of truth. It stands for the onward march of the human race towards even higher objectives. If the universities discharge their duties adequately, then it is well with the nation and the people. Punjab University has given performers 
leaders and achievers in almost all the streams of life, including the presidents and prime ministers of the country. The alumni of Punjab University are a testimony of how the quality education can bring the difference. blessed that so many students of mine like Shushma Savraj, Dr. Kiran Bedi and on the legal side, the judicial side, in fact, three chief justices of India have been a part of this Punjab University. As the years pass by, Punjab University continues to pursue excellence and has grown to emerge as an institution at the pinnacle in innovative teaching, research, community outreach, technology, humanities, social sciences, performing arts and sports. It's great to be a student here and then a faculty at Punjab University because this is, to my mind, the most prestigious university in the country. Punjab University gave us, uh, I think, the basic uh, values and skills to be successful in life and also those professional skills to be, to excel in our professional lives. The university today has 83 academic departments, 18 hostels with AC Joshi Library, a fine arts museum and three vent structure of the Gandhi Bhavan forming its core. I was groomed at Punjab University and I never missed an occasion to bring the Punjab University's name in my conversation and to say that I am a product of Punjab University. It always added an inch to my height whenever I mentioned it. Whatever I am today, it, the credit goes to Punjab University. The environment for competitive exams helped me and inspired me uh, for preparing my civil services exams an international level swimming pool where top performers from all across the north are trained. 
well equipped sports auditorium for various indoor games like kabaddi and gymnastics. State of the art science lab equipped with the most recent facilities to research and development. Open air theater that has given this country a few of its most loved actors and performers. हमारे यहाँ से जो भी जाते हैं एक्टर्स उनके लिए जो मुझे कंप्लीमेंट मिलता है वो ये है कि एक्टर तो वो कमाल होते ही हैं लेकिन व्यक्ति के तौर पर भी वो बहुत मिलनसार और नम्र होते हैं पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी हैज ए ग्रेट लेगेसी ऑफ ग्रेट स्टार वर्ड्स इन रिस्पेक्टिव फील्ड्स वी आर प्राउड दैट मोहम्मद इकबाल द ग्रेट पोइट belong to the punjab university he taught in the university in sare jahan se acha hindustan hamara was written by him artistic gandhi bhavan which stands strong for the very philosophy of punjab university the hub of social interaction student center where memories are created what lovely memories and what nostalgic events come to one's mind as you sit down and remember your past days of study of friendship of naughtiness and of enjoyment times were great we used to walk down to the student center and order in a very ridiculous manner two npes which meant two nimbu panis one sam which meant a samosa there were happy times and then we would also had to you know pinch pennies we would collect all the money on the table and see how much change we had and then we would say chala hot coffee lao bhaiya picturesque botanical garden is a milestone for commitment to keep india's greenest university at its best parameters of uh, excellence in academics in research in administration in uh, you know arts in uh, cultural activities in extracurricular activities and in sports you know punjab university has excelled and made its name and it's a it's an institute to reckon with across the country the learning that i've done the way uh, things were taught to me the grooming i got what i am today is all due to that and i owe that to the university and i really want to do something for the university so that i can repay uh, what i got from uh, this great and mamata a lot has been done but a lot still needs to be done in order that we keep step with the global trends in education and uh our uh and remain ranked among the top institutions of the 21st century by virtue of its history philosophy experience and achievements yeah. punjab university today no, enjoys no, an international no, stature no, not only in india but across the world redefining the practice of leading through learning thank you thank you dr sir yes now anyone who wants to say thank you to the participants and to the others yeah please go ahead uh, uh let me one minute Yes, ma'am. I want to uh, add something. I just want to add. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. A new Punjab Chief Minister, Shri Charanjit Singh Chandni ji, also pursuing PhD from uh, this university. It's a really a proud. Yes. The moment. present, uh, the present Chief Minister. Yes. Of Punjab. Yes. Uh, from Department of uh, Inclusion and so, Exclusion. So a, yes. This is really a proud moment for all. Yes, ma'am. Well. Uh, let me thank uh, you and the uh, you i mean the chairperson of our department as well as the other uh, you know co partners as well as the university uh, authorities also so who has given um, this opportunity to listen in detail about the such uh, i mean the issues the topics that uh, we normally uh, we normally miss it and we it's good to listen this um, uh, this particular lecture also because elders huxley we normally uh, 
uh, very true you have said that we just uh, mention his name and we know a little bit about it but in a detail uh, manner uh, today we have uh, really earned something so we are very thankful to all of you and even uh, to the main speaker also thank you very much sir so with this uh, happy ending so we can thanks once again to each and every one and looking forward to meet again uh, on some other platform and uh, in this series on 2nd october we are having uh, one special lecture of uh, former vice chancellor of gujarat vidya peet uh, professor anamik shah so he would be with us uh, at 12 noon so i would be sharing the link with each and every one and uh, requesting all of you to kindly join and in that uh, particular session we would be declaring the names of the uh, winners of the uh, painting competition also and we would be uh, declaring the name of the person uh, as one award is given by our department uh, to the best gardener of the university so a cash amount of rupees 2100 will also be given so looking forward to meet you once again in the second october program thank you once again Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.